welcome back to this uh, week 4 lecture uh, and the course introduction to professional scientific communication. Now, we are going to come and discuss about the schematics. Okay? Again, the schematics something that we have discussed in the results section that even when you are doing an experiment to explain how you have done the experiment, there are schematics and you have to draw them. So, how do you really draw? Like this is a one of the common schematic all, all who have done some bit of chemistry, biochemistry either in your BSc or class 12, you would have known this. This is citric acid cycle, this is one of the metabolic pathways in your cell and which clearly tells you that how for example, the succinate is converted to fumarate and so on and so forth, you know it is a, it is a kind of a flow chart that is given. It is a complicated diagram, but easy for you to understand, you know otherwise if you have to write everything in a word in the textual form in a pay in a pa in a, in a, in a it will it will take about you know three or four pages no one will make out any meaning out of it it's extremely difficult to explain so often the schematics helps us to understand things in much better way and that is shown in so many you know different ways if you have studied uh, research papers or textbooks if you look into there are you know such kind of schematics shown which explains a pathway for example a given signaling pathway or you know how for example, what is shown here is a radiation can affect different signaling mechanism in the cell and how whole thing is changed and so on. So, these are all always present and we will use it you know to explain. The reason being that schematic helps us to convey things in much better way and that is you know uh, you can easily understand if you open a newspaper. I do not know how many of you have the habit of reading newspaper. If you have read newspaper you know 10 years back. Um, or five years back, there used to be a famous person called R. K. Lakshman. He used to uh, draw these cartoons in the Times of India newspaper. Even now, very similar kind of cartoons, uh, you know, continue in many newspapers. And he used to uh, make one caricature called as common man. He's a common man is somebody who retired, who is struggling for the survival, who finds it very difficult day-to-day -day life. What is shown on the right side you know a person with bald head and uh, grey hair and moustache with the specs and this guy you know pretty much is part of every cartoon that he made you know he, he, you can identify yourself with the common man and he's normally these are about the political message that it, it's done and this particular cartoon is just to honor that person when he passed away you know in 2015 he passed away and it says a nation salutes R.K. Lakshman. These are some of this is caricature, this is the common man and this one on the right side is R. Lakshman with the common man with himself drew. So, that is what the common man is. So, there are number of cartoons that really explain what happens in the country. The one on the top came when there was a match fixing allegations going on in the cricket. It really says that the wicket keeper now telling the batsman take money and get out. right? Uh, things like that, you know, this is not a sporty way, but that explained as to how rampant the match fixing was. Or, for example, sometimes it can be not very sarcastic, but appreciates how people contributed to some national building. For example, what is shown here is that when uh, there was a Gujarat earthquake, right, and there even a beggar could contribute. He says here at a time like this, nothing is too small, even he gives 1 rupee, 2 rupee, whatever little he had and this common man is collecting. What it means is that you guys whoever reads this right looks at this cartoon please contribute even if it is too repeat does not matter contribute to the relief fund. It is a you know huge impact it had on the nation. So, you, the cartoons convey everything you know. So, for example, many of the journals you know have this kind of you know schematic what you call in the such um, you know articles it is pathways it is you know again it conveys important uh, message which talks about some of the in you know, a cascade um, uh, that happens, some of the important events that happens in the cell or how the organisms grow, how the tissue differentiates. There are many complex information that are conveyed using the schematic. So, what is shown here again this is from one of the research article is that how a protein that is not folded properly is removed from the cell right. It talks about the various pathways through which the protein can be degraded whether it is a proteasome, whether it is lysosome and so on. So, that is uh, some of the ways by which you can explain. Here we have looked at how the schematic helps us to 
explain some of the concepts in your research paper much better than writing them out. So we spoke about pathways, we spoke about some of the complex events that happens in the cell, which can be beautifully you know, explained using schematic. This very similar way R.K. Lexman used his uh, cartoon to explain some of the political events. So we are going to use uh, one hypothetical signaling pathway. Okay? Um, this is not something existing, but just you know, something that I made up just to explain how to make schematic. And I am going to narrate that uh, hypothetical pathway, signaling pathway, and then we will see how that can be converted, what I have written in the text, how that can be converted into a schematic, which explains everything that we otherwise you know, find it very difficult to explain using words. And that will help you to understand how do you make schematics. Okay? So, let us see what is written here. So, this is uh, uh, let us read it out and you will find it difficult to comprehend everything and connect everything and that is extremely important for you to realize that despite reading many a times it is difficult to connect each point with the other because although it is given here as a bullets, each one is connected to the other one or the other way. But that cannot be conveyed in the textual form that is why we need schematic. So, let me read it out. The transcription factor TF1 regulate the expression of the gene 1, that is the name gene 1 and this particular gene codes for a protease. So, a protein that whose uh, function is to cleave other protein substrates. The protease cleaves a propeptide to make functional substrate. So, the propeptide is cleaved by the protease therefore, it you know the cleaved form is active which is called the AP that serves as an adapter protein, meaning it goes and binds to some other protein and makes it active or inactive depending on the context. At least two distinct functions for the AP are known, the adapter protein, which is a product after cleaving by the protease, you know processed product. One to bind to kinase 1, an enzyme which adds a phosphate group to substrate that is what kinase and make it active. So, it binds to the kinase 1, it makes it active. This another function is to bind to a subunit protein called SB of kinase 2. There is another kinase which also adds this phosphate group to some other protein and that kinase 2 requires a subunit and this AP now goes and binds to that subunit. Now, already it is difficult for you to connect everything and that is exactly the story, so that is exactly the message. Kinase 2 is a non-functional uh, in the absence of SB. So, it requires SB to be active and SB cannot bind to kinase in it uh, if it forms a complex with the AP. Now, you can see that how it becoming more complicated. So, the TF1 the transcription factor is a substrate for both kinase 1 and kinase 2. Now, you have to connect this particular bullet with the first bullet right. Both phosphorylates TF1, but are two different residues while kinase 1 mediated phosphorylation inactivates. TF1 kinase 2 phosphorylation activates 2F1. So, so it is a very different kind of a regulation. This proposed mechanism identifies a feedback loop between gene 1 and AP through a signaling cascade. Besides the function mentioned above, gene 1 helps in migration of cells through embryonic differentiation by modulating the cytoskeleton. Now, this is what narrated each one would have understood some points, some points very difficult to connect because it is everything written in a textual way, you know, you cannot connect all of them together. Now, that is what we, we, we are going to convert the entire thing that is mentioned here into a schematic. Let us do one after the other. right? What is shown on the top always invariably in every slide is that particular bullet. right? We are going to add to the schematic that we are drawing. The first sentence is transcription factor TF1 regulates the expression of a gene 1 that codes for a protease. Now, you have three different elements in this sentence. One is transcription factor, second is a gene, the third one is a protease. Now, all three have to be you know shown in a schematic. So, how do you do that? So, this is how you can show. So, you draw a gene by drawing a line and a box and then put as a gene 1 that says this segment of the DNA which is represented by the line is a gene and you put an arrow on the top because the direction of the transcription. Therefore, you would expect the transcription factor to bind upstream of it. That is what is shown here TF1 binds and then the gene is possibly on, it may transcribe and then that makes the protein called protease which we have identified by an arrow. Right? So, now the arrow as part of the gene color is very different from the arrow 
that identifies the protease as a product of the gene. So, even the colors are very, very important and you have used the different shapes to identify the transcription factor is different from protease, that is the protease. Now, second bullet, let us see. The protease cleaves a propeptide to make functional substrate AP that serves as an adapter protein. So, the protease has an substrate and the substrate is cleaved. Now, after cleaving, the propeptide now becomes a functional peptide with the name AP, right. So, how do you show that? This is what it is. So, you show a double box with a different color, you call it the pro AP, which is inactive. The protease you are linking it with marrow, saying that protease identifies that to be something that acts upon the protein that is cleaved. Now, you have AP which is active, ok. It is a propeptide now that is active. Now, we are talking about the function of the AP, which is the active AP component and we are going to talk about the two distinct functions. At least two distinct functions for AP are known, one to bind to kinase 1 and make it active. So, it binds to kinase 1 and makes it active. Second one to bind to a subunit protein SB of kinase 2 and kinase 2 is a non-functional in the absence of SB and the SB cannot bind to kinase 2 if it forms a complex with AP. It is a complex you know, statement, we have to show them beautifully. Let us look at the first part much easier that the AP binds to kinase 1 make it active. So, what is shown here is that you know the kinase 1 is shown, the AP goes and binds and you, you show it something like a you know a socket that goes and binds that means that it is a you know the interaction is very very specific and then you bring in some color code for example, AP with kinase 1 is active, you show it as a green, the kinase 1 without AP is inactive, now we show it is in a red form and you connect these two with a double uh, line with double arrow, uh, arrow head saying that this is dynamic, it can be inactive or active depending on whether the AP binds to it, right. Now, let us look into how to connect the second function that is to bind to a subunit protein SB of kinase 2 and kinase 2 is non-functional in the absence of SB, SB cannot bind to kinase 2 if it forms complex with the AP. This is what we are showing here. Now, AP binds to SB, right and then when it binds, right, it is inhibitory in the sense you can see there is a line, at the end of the line there is another small line which indicates it inhibits that particular function. The function is SB binding to kinase 2, ok. So, that SB cannot bind if it is in complex with AP, right. Now, if you remove SB, then the kinase 2 is inactive, if the kinase 2 is bound to SB, then it is active. In other words, the AP if it binds to SB, it can make the kinase 2 inactive. In one it makes active kinase 1, in another it makes inactive, right that is what we are able to convey. Now, the TF1 that we are talking about transcription factor is a substrate for both kinases and both phosphorate TF1, but at least in two different you know residues therefore, the outcome could be different. While the kinase 1 mediated phosphorylation inactivates TF1, kinase 2 phosphorylation activates TF1. So, how do you show this? You can show here like this. So, you have TF1, you have already drawn TF1 on the DNA. So, you show it as you know small circle on the top of the TF1 you know the rectangle, one in two different residues, different place and you have shown it with color because that shows also whether it becomes active or inactive. So, if kinase 1 phosphorylates, you know the active one becomes inactive likewise if kinase 2 phosphorylates the inactive becomes active and so on. So, now you can go and say finally, that this proposed mechanism identifies a feedback loop between gene 1 and AP through a signaling cascade. So, you can see here that how a gene 1 which is thrown here and AP which is a product resulting from um, the action of the protease coded by gene 1 as a feedback loop which regulates the gene 1 expression itself you know. So, that is pretty obvious from this uh, diagram that is shown and then you say that what is the uh, net result, why should you have this feedback? It says that you know gene 1 helps in the migration of cells through embryonic differentiation because the protease may have other substrate and that substrate may have some other function and one of the function is the embryonic differentiation by modulating the cytoskeleton. Now, the 
you know, the embryonic differentiation is regulated and this is a signaling mechanism which regulates that particular process. Now, whole thing what you are narrated, we are able to put together in a, you know, in a schematic which explains beautifully as to how we are able to convey, you know, this, you know, you remove everything, there is no legend, nothing, you just put a title saying that this explains, you know, a schematic pathway to, to explain the proposed mechanism by which gene 1 regulates the embryonic process which is regulated by say the propeptide or AP, you know, a signaling mechanism, right. So, you can say this and this explains, you know, otherwise you would have taken two pages to write this, but everything can be beautifully explained using this kind of a diagram. So, that is one of the ways by which you can, you know, explain. So, you may want to practice such a kind of a thing, you read about some uh, mechanism that is narrated in the text, do not look at the pathway. You try to draw it yourself and see, now go back to the journal and see how people have drawn it and how you can improve. So, this really, really explains you. It is not only when you are writing research paper, but if you are a master student or whatever, if you are writing even exams, you want to explain something, you may not have much time to explain everything. You can draw a schematic in your answer book. That would convey to the teacher or instructor that you are able to explain what happens without really jotting down everything by word by word, right. So, that is that is the way to convey the thing, it is helpful. Um, so, you should be able to practice more and improve your skill set.